Shiv, you're on mute. Thank you, panelists and audience, for participating in this roundtable. We propose to make full and hopefully effective use of the next hour and 50 minutes. The structure is as follows. We begin with a five-minute overview of the urgency of climate action by Alex Halliday, who is at the Earth Institute of Columbia University that he directs. Then this would be followed by our distinguished panel. We have five panelists who each will have five to seven minutes. And the structure of the order is, first we have Scott Barrett of uh, SEPA, uh, Columbia University, followed by Lina Srivastava, who is at the Institute, International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis at Vienna. The third speaker would be Lola Vallejo of IDRI, that's the Institute for Sustainable Development and International Relations here in Paris, followed by Fran uh, Franny Lotier of uh, Southbridge Investments. She comes to us from Kigali. And the last speaker of this section would be uh, Professor Jeffrey Sachs uh, of Columbia University. He's coming to us also from New York. And as I said, each of the panelists would have five to seven minutes. This would be followed by a panel discussion just amongst the panelists for about 30 minutes that I would uh, moderate. And uh, then we have the Q&A coming in from the audience uh, that uh, Alex Halliday will uh, moderate for the last 30, 35 minutes. And at the very end, we'll have a very brief uh, wrap up from Alex and myself. So thank you again. And uh, I would now invite Alex to uh, tell us about the urgency of climate action. Thank you, Alex. Thank you very much, Chief. So uh, it's great to have this team of people here today. Um, the reason why we're here today um, is of course, the climate is changing, uh, but also uh, in the next few weeks, We've got a lot of things happening. This month is really busy from the point of view of focusing on climate action in particular. Uh, on uh, 22nd, 23rd of April, President Biden is gonna be inviting 40 world leaders to, well, he'll have 40 world leaders at his summit on climate. And this is uh, a massively important uh, way of getting people on board ahead of events later in the year like COP26 in Glasgow to think about how they can take bigger and bolder and more uh, uh, effective action on the climate crisis. I just wanted to say um, a few things as we think about in this month in particular about the climate crisis and Earth Day is of course coincides with the, um, the Biden administration's uh, summit. Um, science has been modeling climate for an awfully long time now. And in particular for the last several decades, they've been warning that the climate is changing and the world is warming up fast. Um, the evidence now suggests that climate change is going to be worse and faster in its progress and harder to predict than most scientists, let alone the wider public, had realized. So scientists actually didn't realize, I don't think, how serious this issue is going to become. And it's also not just serious, but it's immensely hard problem to solve. And part of what we're here to talk about today is how hard it is and what we need to do about that. Um, we're now able to see new kinds of phenomena that we didn't know about before because we're seeing the climate change. And so Hurricane Harvey was astonishing because suddenly we realized that hurricanes slow down and the big action isn't really from the wind any longer. It's the amount of rain that falls and, and gets dumped on communities. There are other major things we're seeing like wildfires. And so to some extent, we're seeing the climate change in a way we hadn't quite predicted in the, in the past. But the other thing that's really important is that we're now, we've now got better records of what the world was like the last time we had over 400 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And it's truly frightening. Uh, 20 meters of sea level rise relative to where we are today. Um, and actually the, the thing is perhaps, perhaps most disturbing is that we are actually poking a sleeping dragon right now because it's quite clear that despite all the talk about climate change, emissions are increasing despite the growth of renewables, um, the, which are an increasing fraction of our energy portfolio. The total usage of energy is increasing dramatically as a result of people's standards of living improving. And so if people's standards of living carry on improving, which of course we all hope for, then we're actually on a trajectory not towards 
500 parts per million at the end of the century, which is what we're heading for if we carry it carry on at current levels, but something that's much closer to 1,000 parts per million. So 1,000 parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere were back 40 million years ago, and there were no ice sheets at all. If you took away the ice sheets uh, completely, then you would actually have um, 70 meters higher sea level around the world, global average sea level. So this is huge, this is massive, and it's a, a massively urgent problem we have to turn around quickly and get to grips with. And we, like I say, I don't think we realize just how serious this is. The climate system is slow, it takes a while, it'll take a long time to equilibrate to these new levels of CO2, but nonetheless, we can't afford not to act, we have to act. So with that in mind, I think we wanted to take a look at how we act, and in particular, how do we deal this in the, with this in the context of the political economy and decision-making and incentives that we can create in society. And that's why we pulled together this amazing group of speakers today. And uh, I'm very excited to be partnering uh, the Earth Institute and Columbia University, partnering with Sciences Po on this. And so with that in mind, I'm gonna hand over to Sheev, who's gonna basically um, explain what's gonna happen next. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Alex. Uh, uh, right now, we're gonna have Scott uh, Barrett of Columbia University coming in. And just to give a heads up, uh, five to seven minutes, uh, followed by uh, Lina Srivastava after him. Scott, over to you. Thank you so much, Shiv, and thank you, Alex. Uh, I hope my internet is stable so I can get through my five to seven minutes. I agree with everything Alex said. Uh, this is uh, an issue of demanding action by the whole world, and um, there's no time to lose. So that is for sure. Um, we've been negotiating uh, globally on climate change since about 1988. Um, and the formal negotiations began in 1990. And what's really important to understand is that the whole time these negotiations have been underway, emissions have been rising worldwide. M more or less, Alex was pointing to that. In fact, the total amount of emissions since 1990 exceeds the cumulative emissions from the start of the Industrial Revolution in Britain in 1750 until 1990. And I don't think there's any way you can look at this record and think there has been success. And the negotiations started formally in 1990. And how have they been organized? They've been organized around setting of targets. Uh, one target is the global target. So if you look at the Paris Agreement, the entire world has agreed that it should act together to limit mean global temperature change to two degrees C relative to the pre-industrial level, preferably 1.5. Uh, well, it's very easy to agree on a collective target and that's because no one's responsible for meeting it. Now, how do you achieve it? Well, um, the way that Paris was constructed, countries, propose their own pledge, they make pledges for how they will contribute toward meeting the, the global goal. If you add up all those pledges, and this was done by the way, before Paris, the days before Paris. So we had these data when we were in Paris. You add up all those pledges and what you see is that global emissions will keep rising through 2030. And it is impossible for the world to be on that track and at the same time to meet its collective goal. So what's going on here? One thing I would say about goals is of course we all set them as individuals. And I think there's a really fascinating psychology of goal setting. Uh, there's actually research showing that in marathons, uh, people, there tends to be this clustering of um, uh, 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 marathon times just below three hours, just below four hours. Uh, so people, and there's evidence that people will, uh, if they're getting close to that magic time, will actually speed up uh, and to make it. So there's clearly some kind of motivation around a prominent number like a three hour, you know, doing a marathon under three hours. Um, I accept that there's this uh, consideration, but what we're dealing with with climate is a collective action problem. And so, uh, it's not uh, me reaching my goal that matters, it's all of us reaching our collective goal. 
And what this does is it causes countries to look over their shoulder at what others are doing. And we've been, we've been seeing this since the climate negotiations began. So the main point I wanna make about targets is on their own, they're not sufficient. But I don't think there's any measure you can look at that could say they are. On their own, they're not. I'm not saying that they're bad, but if we expect that you're gonna get a different outcome uh, by doing the same thing we've been doing for 30 years, uh, I think that's not, it's not reliable. Okay. Now, what does work? So let's look out in the world, you know, when it actually functions. One example is the world has phased out uh, lead from gasoline worldwide, without a treaty, by the way. Now, why did that happen? It's a combination of reasons. It's that lead um, causes um, really lead. There are substitutes. And there are other factors involving the economic system. There are economies of scale uh, in manufacturing, which means that the more you make of the unleaded, the cheaper it com becomes to make unleaded. And there are these network connections uh, between different markets. I was really uh, impressed reading an article uh, in the late 1990s that Sudan was phasing out lead in petrol. And you have to wonder why would Sudan, which had other issues <laughs> to deal with at that time, do that? Well, it's because they had built a new refinery and they needed to export. So what I, what I think you have to look at is what, you know, what causes transformations worldwide? And it's a, it's a complex uh, variety of things. It's not that there was a global target, there was no global target, and yet we still did it. A, a really great success to focus on is the Montreal Protocol, which phased out CFCs worldwide. Uh, now, what's, what's fascinating about this, there were targets, but actually those targets were, were really not what was driving the behavior. What was driving the behavior was the belief by all the market participants that the world was changing and that all the money was to be made in substitutes and not in the original uh, chemicals. And what made that treaty so successful was that it coupled, uh, it created these beliefs by um, establishing a trade measure between parties to the agreement and non-parties. And what this causes is that as more countries come in the agreement, the market for the countries that aren't in the agreement shrinks and shrinks, which makes more countries want to join the agreement. And you get this positive feedback effect. And that's why we can be today in a situation where all the countries are in and they're all phasing out CFCs worldwide. There's no mechanism like this in the Paris Agreement. There's no mechanism like this in any of the previous uh, climate agreements. Now, we do have a new climate agreement, the Kigali Amendment negotiated under the Montreal Protocol, which limits the production and consumption of hydrofluorocarbons, HFCs. The Kyoto Protocol tried to limit this, failed. Kigali, I think is gonna succeed because it incorporates this uh, trade measure, which has a fundamental effect on behavior um, and shifts the market. So we need to be thinking in a much more strategic way about how we uh, address this problem because having you know, greater ambition, greater worry and doing the same thing more or less that we've been doing for 30 years is not gonna be successful. And the nice thing about Kigali is that it, is, it was done after, it was negotiated months after Paris. So what that tells us is that we can have other agreements like Kigali for other parts of the climate problem. It does mean, this approach does mean breaking up this problem into smaller pieces and trying to attack the individual pieces. And the last thing I'll say is, we have this fundamental problem of the need to stabilize CO2 concentrations. Bringing global emissions to zero, this is like the most ambitious thing you could possibly imagine. There's a backstop to all of this, which is to uh, have a, a, a technology for removing carbon directly out of the air. And this is the only backstop for addressing the greatest collective action problem in all of human history. And the amount of R&D and effort that has gone into this is really uh, pitiful compared to what is needed. So there needs to be collective action also in areas like uh, R&D and technology development I'm not saying that this is a, you know, a miracle, but it's clearly a, a technology. Oh, that I need to wrap this up. 
yeah, yeah. that demands uh, our attention. So um, uh, we're going to have to do a lot of things uh, and we're going to have to address the scale issue, Alex, that you pointed to. Thanks so much. Okay, thanks. Um, Lena Stravastava is going to talk to us now. Thank you very much, uh, Alex, and thank you uh, to both of you and Shiv for having me in this uh, roundtable. Uh, let me just build off the comments that both of you uh, made just a little while earlier. As you mentioned, Alex, that scientists have been modeling climate change uh, changes that have been taking place. Similarly, I think some of us have also been part of several pathway exercises uh, that have been done over the years to look at deep, deep decarbonization, 100% uh, uh, renewable energy economy, and so on. To, uh, to, to focus on illustrating the feasibility of achieving these defined goals uh, with some assessment of the implications for the means uh, of doing so. Uh, but in these exercises, the pathway exercises to achieve uh, what today we are referring to also uh, as a next step of a net zero uh, target, we have tended to focus on access to technologies, on the investments that are required, and the economics of actions that, that have to be taken with, I believe, quite inadequate attention to issues of equity and justice. And I think this gives us one more reason to uh, reevaluate uh, pathways. Uh, apart from the impact of, I think, the elephant in the room, which is uh, the COVID crisis that we have been living in for the last, well, over a year now. Uh, so I do believe that we need to go back to the drawing board to take a look at uh, the pathways and to be able to convince countries, especially the developing world, that, that there are things that can be done in this space. On the other hand, I think while we uh, focused on these macro level models to look at uh, the realm of feasibility for achieving mitigation, the more bottom up assessments typically came up with constraints or barriers to sustainable consumption and production relating to issues of capacities and capabilities, of access to finance, technology and markets, cultural preferences and so on. And rarely did the two meet, neither in terms of communities nor in terms of the realities that, uh, that they were addressing themselves to. Uh, and, and I think this resulted in a little bit of a lack of empathy for the situation in uh, the developing world, in particular, the global south, if we do want to call it that. But coming back very briefly to, uh, to the, to the post-COVID world that we are, well, I can't even call it post-COVID as yet, but uh, the post-COVID world that will evolve, it is, we are not there as yet. Um, this crisis has put back several countries, including the country that I come from, India, uh, by several years or decades uh, in terms of the poverty levels that we are dealing with, uh, in terms of the diversion that we will now, now require of funds to go back towards some of the development challenges that we are facing. So it's not going to be easy. As we have seen, there was a pushback in recent days uh, by the Minister for Environment in India on committing to net zero targets. And that again is, is not very surprising. So the question is, what do we do from here forward? And I think the key challenge for the global community is going to be to see how we address ourselves, not just to the challenge of climate change, which as you said, Alex, is real and, um, and staring us in the face already uh, with the promise of, of reaching tipping points fairly quickly but to be able to address the multiple risks and vulnerabilities that humanity is facing and to be able to look at the multiple dividends that can be possible and focus on how you achieve these multiple dividends to be able to respond to the multiple risks. We cannot any longer afford to focus on a unidimensional uh, problem, no matter how big that is because of the differences of the here and now and the challenges that we are facing and the problems that might be coming up in the next few years. So I think that is critically important. Uh, having said that, even if I look at a country like India, um, our vulnerabilities are huge the, uh, to the problem of climate change and the impacts of climate change. And 
we need to be able to address that. But I think we are again finding ourselves extremely constrained to be able to put the climate change agenda up and forefront when we are dealing with the problem of climate of uh, COVID that that we are seeing just now. But still, I think there are many opportunities on the multiple dividends fronts that I spoke about that that we need to, to be able to take a look at. Uh, I think the opportunities arise from the experience that COVID has and the response to COVID has provided us. We need to be able to avoid lock-ins because as is said by the International Energy Agency, several of the developing countries have yet to put in place a lot of the infrastructure that has to come in place in the next several decades to be able to meet our development goals. How do we do that? I think that is, a, that is critically important. I think there is a real opportunity for us today uh, as we are dealing with COVID to take a serious look at urban regeneration options. Uh, cities in most developing countries are a complete mess and uh, uh, in dire need of investments and uh, moving towards sustainability pathways. I think there is also a real opportunity for us to leapfrog towards digital service-based economies that will bode well for sustainable consumption and production. And the COVID crisis has shown us that we can indeed innovate and adapt very quickly if we have the right kinds of institutional measures and incentives in place. And I think these are some of the things we need to focus on. We also need to take a relook at globalization. And I know I'm out of time, so just one minute, half a minute, uh, Alex. So we also need to take a look at how we have globalized because we had this opportunity to pause and take a look at how we have interpreted globalization and the extent to which we have taken it. Today, the focus has to be on a judicious mix of globalization and localization with a very firm focus on jobs and, and employment opportunities. And I think this is extremely important. And finally, I'll stop by saying that we have shown also uh, the fact that developed countries in particular can mobilize huge amount of resources in a relatively short period of time. But we did not see that kind of commitment uh, when we spoke about climate change funds of various times. There is a huge erosion of trust and confidence. How can we ensure that some of these resources, recovery resources, are used also to build back the system of multilateralism and international cooperation better? Thank you. Okay, thank you, Lena. Uh, and now over to Lola Vallejo, who's going to speak to us. Thanks. Um, I. I know the targets were kind of having a, a hard time. So I wanted to start by um, maybe saying in defense of targets that uh, of course they're not an end in themselves, but climate targets rooted in science are effectively the only way we have to have a, a yardstick for ambition. Um, and there's currently a somehow understandable backlash against um, the notion of carbon neutrality, both from you know, the, as, as, uh, as Lena mentioned, uh, the Indian energy minister pushing back and saying, you know, it's not to us to commit to net zero or even environmental activists uh, calling it a, a distraction to, to avoid action in the short term. Um, so I think that an answer to kind of rehabilitate uh, carbon neutrality or, or, or um, long-term climate action uh, is that indeed you need decisive action in the short term. Um, I think an interesting yardstick that is also coming out more strongly is the notion that uh, large developed economies should commit to at least a 50% reduction by 2030 of their emissions uh, for developed countries only, um, be it you know, US, Japan, Canada, South Korea, uh, there's a kind of a, a, um, a number coalescing around those short-term targets. Um, another way to, to rehabilitate the carbon neutrality concept is to have greater clarity regarding the use of offsets or uh, carbon capture and storage. And, and I'd like to maybe um, challenge slightly what, what Scott said. I think there's a neutrality has two components, reducing emissions and increasing the sequestration of CO2. Uh, but so far, countries have been a lot less forward in, in clarifying the second part of the equation. Um, we also have to be clear about the phasing out of fossil fuels. So uh, clarity regarding the, the end point. Um, and I think there's been some uh, nervousness regarding some of the, 
latest declarations around net zero that maybe net zero could become uh, an umbrella term for you know, continuing fossils as it is, but making heroic assumptions regarding the development of CCS. Um, another thing that is very dear to, to Idri is the, the biodiversity collapse, um, which is not only a, a nice, nice to have thing, but is actually uh, an integral part of, of meeting the climate neutrality targets globally. Uh, without functioning ecosystems, we simply won't be able to uh, to meet the carbon neutrality challenge uh, by 2050 or mid-century. Um, so it's very important that we also support net zero biodiversity positive narratives and pathways to decarbonization. That is um, taking into consideration when you think about modernizing agriculture that you also have practices which are sustainable for biodiversity um, and that you make reasonable assumptions in terms of the global supply of bioenergy and um, and the, the the carbon capture and storage possibility. Um, and it's encouraging that the World Economy Forum is, is also starting to push this, uh, this narrative. Um, I'd also say that innovation is great, but um, I would add that well-targeted innovation matters. And there's one of the, the, the key moment in the, the 22nd of April summit uh, convened by the American administration is, is also uh, you know, dedicated to innovation. Um, but I think it's very important to be effective that we clearly target it to usage where it's most effective. For instance, hydrogen is, is all the hype and all the rage right now. Um, but we really need, to, when planning for the development of hydrogen, to think how is it going to be used in which sector, probably industry and heavy fuel, uh, heavy duty transportation and freight. Um, what I find interesting is that industry is clearly one of the areas where there are particular opportunities to put in place international cooperation. Um, from that perspective, I think the, the US coming back in the Paris Agreement and uh, convening this summit uh, in a few days time is a great opportunity to talk about global green procurement for things like clean steel um, and creating lead markets to support the establishment of uh, clean plants for hard to abate sectors. And I think we now have a, uh, a decisive size uh, to push for breakthrough, um, not in technology because we have those technologies, but we need to scale them up commercially. Um, and I think we could make quick progress on that. Maybe even more importantly, innovation is great, but I think pro-poor climate solutions is better. So we need to give priority to solutions that are both effective at curbing climate emissions, but also contribute to reducing inequalities as opposed to widening them. Um, and I strongly support what Lina said regarding that as well. Um, coming from the countries of Gilets Jaunes and Yellow Vest, um, we know all too well how uh, devising climate policies separately from broader justice issues is just a no-go, uh, even in a developed country. So from that perspective, my personal feeling is that the green bus rapid transit, like electric buses, systems and cities, or railway development, they don't get as much airtime as um, EVs or, or batteries, sometimes in, you know, in those uh, international discussions. And I think that's a shame because that would also probably change the inclusive nature of the, of the dialogue. Okay, um, no, need to wrap it up. So. I think inclusiveness is going to be major going forward. The IEA has put up a people-centered clean energy transition uh, commission, which is gonna be very interesting, but I'd just like to say that to make the transition inclusive, we would need maybe a couple more uh, things. I would like to suggest that uh, directing international funding to explicitly support transition, such as you know, the EU has a dress transition mechanism, which is a big fund. Could we do the sim a same thing, but at the international level, maybe through the GCF or others? Um, and also saying that the governance issue is extremely important uh, to drive massive transition with popular support. Um, and in France, we had the Citizen Convention, which I'd be really happy to say more. Thank okay. you. Okay, let's leave it at that. Thank you very much, that was great. Uh, now, Franny Lutier. Franny. Yes, thank you very much, Alex. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going 
going to pick up on the remark you used at the opening on how we act and also what Scott said in terms of the importance of behavior and uh, make my, uh, my arguments stitching some of the ideas around the post-COVID situation and the role of innovation. So let me start with what I found surprising. I've been very surprised by the result that has been published recently of how fast impact investing has moved over and above any expectation at this point in time in addressing sustainability issues. The second surprising factor is the action of mayors. If you look at what the mayor of Paris, Mayor Hidalgo, the mayor of Miami, Suarez, and the mayor of Kigali, Mayor Rubin Gisa, they've come up with actions that have really change the way we think the sustainability goals can be achieved at the local government level. And then, of course, the third one, which is not new, is the uh, action by youth, uh, whether it's uh, Vanessa Nakate from uh, Uganda or, or uh, Greta Thunberg from Sweden. The youth have really embraced these issues of sustainability and have taken them to a level that we did not anticipate. So I asked myself why these three unexpected results. And the first, if you look at the investment area, it's because there was a good alignment between financial results and impact on sustainability measures. And therefore for investors, putting money and picking winners in, that drive you in the direction of sustainability became feasible. And that drew more and more investment. And then you have somebody like Larry Fink coming and making an announcement about how BlackRock is going to change. And that gives even more incentives for the rest of the financial sector to move. If you look at the mayors, it's because there was a nice alignment between policy and politics. Citizens were driving for bike lanes, uh, quieter neighborhoods, cleaner breathing air, and all of that aligning to a political agenda which allowed the mayors to then deliver on something that otherwise would have been very difficult to achieve. And for the youth, they're really looking at their future. They have a lot of time on their hands with not much to lose if they go ahead and argue and manifest for their future. So the self-interest of these three different groups were very much aligned. And in a way that, uh, for example, if you looked at what Herbert Simon would have argued on the uh, social receptivity of human minds, or what uh, we would have seen from Thomas Schelling in terms of micromotives and macro behavior, or even the arguments of uh, de Tocqueville in terms of self-interest and how that drives large-scale political change. But I'd like to focus my remarks on the question of innovation. And I draw on the very interesting empirical work of Eric von Hippel, where he found that if you look at how innovation happens, it happens in three dimensions that self-reinforce. The users are the largest ones in innovation. So take solar energy, you come up with a technology and people figure out how to use it. I take a solar strip, I put it on a backpack, and I charge devices, mobile devices for kids in Cote d'Ivoire who can then go and have e-learning at school. I put a massive solar park and I can supply energy to a utility. Or I have a business that puts solar panels in individual small businesses and I transform the fishing industry use of refrigeration. So the ability of users to innovate, driven by their self-interest, taking solutions of innovation from others has made a big impact and that's a fantastic uh, opportunity. The other one that also struck me is you take the fossil fuel industry. They know that the time end is coming, so what have they done? They have now been the biggest investors in the electron business. You take the decisions by Total, Chevron, Anadarko and others, where they buy up and, and invest in renewable energy, they invest in carbon sequestration technologies, and they are driving the electron business because they know the future is electric and therefore as energy companies, they need to move in that direction. Again, driven by self-interest. And then the last example, I, I think that is really equally uh, um, exciting in my view, is how uh, the payment systems, which has then enabled smart metering for electricity and pay as you go, which reduces the consumption overall of electricity, has driven innovation for now having distributed energy solutions in, in villages, in rural areas, and even now 
in urban areas in emerging markets. So my main argument is that if we can find a way to take the, the results of what people have now seen as the benefits of cleaner uh, solutions uh, for, for transport and for energy, as we've seen now with the post-COVID or with the COVID environment with people working from home and enjoying the quiet streets and the clean air and the, and the, uh, and, and the ability to work from home, that if we can harness that self-interest and drive it through better education on what sources of innovation could take us there, I think this is something we would be able to achieve. And therefore, what Scott was saying at the beginning is if we are to really speed up uh, how should we do it? And I think Alex, you had that question at the at the beginning as well. And the, the 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 closest equivalent I have is what we did when we said it's not just about beating your competitor in terms of of military technology, but let's go to the moon, right? So the, there was no definition of how you get there, just the ambition, the broad ambition, and then self interest aligned, and 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 there was a, a race for getting there first that generated a whole slew of innovation. Could we, with the SDGs, def uh, allow such a process to take place? And I think self-interest driven transformation, in my view, is going to be key because that is exponential in the way it will achieve results. There are no boundaries to how the individual human mind can create. Thank you. Franny, that was great. Thank you very much. Okay, over to Jeff Sachs. Jeff. Thanks uh, very much. Hello to everybody. Uh, hello to all friends. Uh, I, I think uh, the situation uh, is actually uh, clarifying and, uh, and improving in important ways uh, because we've lost so much time. We understand now that uh, zero by 50 uh, is the right uh, target. And many of the world's uh, leading economies have signed up to it. And this is, in my view, uh, a game changer. Uh, we have uh, much more clarity about what we need to do, when we need to do it, and how to do it. Uh, getting to zero by 2050 or uh, thereabouts uh, is basically uh, I think pretty well understood at this point. Uh, it means uh, the conversion of power generation to zero carbon uh, electricity. Uh, it means the electrification of transport. Uh, it means the electrification of home heating uh, and uh, residential uh, building use. Uh, and it means the substantial electrification of industrial applications or the use of zero carbon electricity to produce green fuels such as hydrogen or uh, green methane and so on. So I think the technological pathways to get close to net zero are pretty much in hand actually. And to get to zero are at least on the drawing board or at the prototype stage for some of the harder sectors. Uh, what has been missing is, of course, uh, clarity and agreements on uh, doing this. And the biggest obstacles uh, in practice have been the fossil fuel producing countries of the world, uh, not the vast majority of the world, but those 10 or so countries that account for 80% or so of the fossil fuel use. I think that while we're not done uh, with that difficult group uh, and the situation in the United States uh, remains fragile, we have the real possibility of the US, the European Union, UK, China, Japan, Korea, and other large economies signing on and actually pursuing net zero on this really sensible, achievable, and relatively low cost transformation pathway. So I'm not so pessimistic. I'm not hugely optimistic or naively so because the world's governed by stupid people uh, and by uh, stupid outcomes. Uh, but still we're in a much better situation than we were before. 
uh, because there's a lot more clarity. The European Green Deal is a big deal. Uh, the fact that President Xi Jinping has said zero no later than 2060, and it's incorporated in the 14th plan and into the work stream that was agreed uh, several weeks ago is a big deal. Uh, the fact that Prime Minister Suga uh, of Japan has uh, committed Japan to zero by 2050 and Korea has its own uh, green deal is a big deal. And the fact that this is achievable, uh, if not 100% and 80% with pretty, pretty clear shot and the other parts of uh, what's missing right now on the carbon side, not so hard to figure out uh, is very promising. I've always believed we should just be much more straightforward in quantitative regulation. I think economists mess this up in important ways by talking incessantly about carbon trading and carbon pricing as the magic bullet. They are subsidiary instruments. A much stronger uh, approach is regulation. No new coal-fired power plants, no new uh, fossil fuel power generation approved uh, unless uh, there are except, tiny exceptions to that, but unless clearly part of a zero by 2050 strategy. That, to my mind, is how the Montreal Protocol really worked. It was a quantitative set of objectives. Each country was told, phase out. What made it easy was that CFCs could be replaced by HFCs. Uh, now, it's not quite as easy with the CO2, but it's not a complete imponderable anymore because the price of uh, photovoltaics and uh, offshore wind as well as onshore wind and other uh, zero carbon uh, power has come down so decisively. So uh, I know uh, I'll end at this point. Uh, I think we have a much clearer path. My goal in, in my daily stump speech, which is daily several times a day, is that countries should get to Glasgow in November with a zero by 2050 commitment. And then, you know, learn how to do that. It's better if you learn how to do that first, uh, but if you don't know how to do it first, commit, because when you do the homework, it's actually not so hard to accomplish. So our obstacles are not the lack of really good alternatives. Our obstacles are a uh, lack of clarity that remains in many places and uh, the resistance of fossil fuel owners in a few places, coming down to a, a smaller and smaller number. Uh, we have Australia, Russia, Saudi Arabia, half the United States, uh, Alberta, and a few other parts of the world to uh, convince, win over, or just defeat politically. But this is what remains to be done. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Jeff. You started off with gloom and doom from me, and you ended up on a positive note from Franny and Jeff. It was great. So over to you, Shu. Yeah, OK. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the five of you have taken on uh, partially converging, but there are distinct kind of strains uh, where you don't converge at all. Uh, what I see uh, as a point of convergence is, is an underlying sense that planning is important. Uh, that governments need to plan, they need to uh, uh, intervene in the market, they need to actually uh, drive innovation. Uh, so can S Scott, uh, Lola and Franny to begin with, can you tell us about what should be kind of the role of the state? Because the state has been kind of battered and there is a sense that you can just actually get all of this through to the market especially given what Lena uh, emphasized the issues of social inclusion, how do you kind of actually have uh, and uh, both innovation as well as social inclusivity while we are kind of getting to net zero? So planning role of the state where targets are important, but they're not the end, they're just a means to an end. So I'd like to open the floor for, 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 for you to kind of discuss uh, again, return of plans and planning. Um, well, if I may, I think the, 
a key brick in the the planning is um well we talked about the global goal of reaching net zero by 2050 i would just disagree that uh every country needs to have the same date because i think it's just contrary to um well the defined nature of um self-determination and also the fact that countries have different starting points um but I think it's important that every country has a, a plan and a roadmap and the decarbonization plan is, is key. Uh, the EU Green Deal is the EU trying to have such a roadmap and laying out a, a, a huge stock of policies to get there. Um, many countries have a, a long-term strategy. I think the main problem is even countries which have a, a good strategy in place, there's a lack of ownership in various ministries. And that's certainly true for France, um, where we have the national low carbon strategy, but still um, the environment ministry losing out uh, to other more powerful ministries, as is often the case um, on particular sectoral topics. Um, I would say that the state has a huge role to play in particular in scaling up commercial innovations. And I mentioned its buying power earlier. And just to reiterate, I think um, states committing to um, creating lead markets for uh, clean basic materials uh, such as steel would have a really long way uh, towards building those innovations commercially which could then benefit other emerging economies uh, and developing countries. Um, I think that's one of the main contributions that states could have in, in developed countries, um, uh, together with you know, committing to slowly phasing out support to fossil fuels, uh, in particular at home, but also abroad in the projects they support. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Lola. Uh, um, yeah, Shifa, I would uh, I would say I I, I agree with uh, the point that Lola made on the role of the state in creating markets, uh, so that all of this innovation out there can actually find a space to get to scale and uh, and find the financing that is needed. So that's a very critical role. Uh, the other one is the in the education sector. I was uh, surprised when I looked at my kids. They are the ones who taught me how to recycle because they learned that at school and they brought those lessons home and I, my behavior changed because they had an education that gave them knowledge about how to do things differently. So I think there's a very strong role of the state in enhancing knowledge and si the scientific knowledge we have to be available more broadly so that people can change their behavior. And then, of course, there's a very important role of regulation, which Lola also mentioned. And I think another one is co-investment. Uh, some of the reasons why the scale of impact investing surprised everybody is because to the largest extent, it was incentivized by government. If Germany hadn't made the massive investment in the solar energy space, we wouldn't have cheap solar energy panels today. So there is a big role of government in driving uh, investment, uh, so co-investment and investment, at least for the uh, uh, st uh, starting point, uh, are very important. And then the last area, there is this myopia because uh, voters are very myopic, right? They don't vote many times for the long term. And I think civil servants, which is the other part of government we don't talk much about, but civil servants have a very big role to bridge the policy politics gap. And I think this is an area where we need to pay attention because of the myopia of electoral system. Mm -hmm. uh, shall, shall I, did you want me to? Yeah, so thanks so much. Um, my gosh, the word planning, I haven't heard that uh, very recently. Uh, when I was doing my PhD, it was pretty popular. Um, and a lot of economics was about central planning. Um, I, I uh, think that the, um, the need is for planning to some extent, of course, because I think the, the need to stabilize the climate um, requires thinking through um, not just the end goal, but a transition to how to get there. But what I would emphasize is not planning from a top-down uh, perspective, but strategy. Uh, for, for how to get there. 
And this is what I think has always been missing from the approach we've taken to address climate change. It's been very direct. You know, the problem is emissions. We need to lower emissions. So let's set targets for lowering emissions. And then the focus turns to things like, as Jeff mentioned, tradable permit systems. Well, they only work if you have the apparatus of government that will um, uh, assure the property right and, um, and the enforcement. And the, that approach, um, if you have um, the effectiveness of government could be, uh, uh, could, could work. And, you know, I don't have any ideological position on this. I don't really care about that approach. Uh, I just care about something that works. Um, that's my, so I think Jeff and I are probably very similar in that respect. Um, but I don't think that just shifting from that kind of approach to something else is going to necessarily solve the problem. And, and this is actually a worry I have. Um, with also with combining a uh, goal on climate with other goals. I, I, of course, I agree that all these goals matter to but I don't know uh, if that's true. Um, uh, the last thing I really wanna say is you need government, of course, because we're talking about a public good and the whole reason governments exist in the first place is to supply public good. But this is a global public good uh, addressing climate change. And we know how important that is. Uh, here, here's one indication. The last time the US tried to do something serious about climate change was in a bill called the Waxman-Markey bill. The, this is a 1400 page bill. The first, pay, the first paragraph, of this bill, which was a domestic bill, was about China and India, mentioned by name. And implicitly, it was about the whole world and what the world was doing. Uh, Alex mentioned that Biden is convening this meeting later this month uh, of world leaders. The reason for that is each country is only willing to go forward if it has confidence that others will go with it and that the totality of all their efforts uh, bring about the, the goal that they want to see. I think this comes back again and again. How can you do that? And I don't think the target setting by themselves works. I don't really care if anyone agrees with me for saying that, but we've been doing this for 30 years. So if it works so well, why has it not worked to this point? And I'm not opposed to targets, don't get me wrong. It's like, I don't think they're bad. It's just that on their own, they're insufficient. If you couple them with the mechanisms that bring about real change because you've changed incentives, then I think they can be powerful. But on their own, I don't think they're sufficient. Uh, uh, Jeff and Lena. Yeah. Um... We haven't really been setting targets for 30 years. We've been setting uh, goals for 30 years, like stabilizing the greenhouse uh, gas concentration in the atmosphere to avoid dangerous anthropogenic interference in the climate system. That's a nice aspiration and a goal, but it's not actually a target that is a, a target for any government. And when we did set uh, targets, they were, yeah, stupid, dumb, limited, uh, and uh, easily opposed. So we set the Kyoto uh, targets, which were completely unconvincing uh, and fairly meaningless and, and detached from the actual uh, UNFCCC. Uh, they weren't about stabilizing the greenhouse gas concentration. They were about something between 2008 and 2012. And if the goals, uh, don't really make sense. You can't sell them. But I think what's true, uh, and I agree with Scott, is there, there are two issues in political economy in this. One is, there are actually three issues. Okay, so one is their fossil fuel interests. Very strong, very powerful. It was the most powerful lobby of the 20th century. It was implicated with the military. There was vast wealth. Companies like Exxon were the world's most capitalized companies. 
the power of this industry was uh, unparalleled by any other industry. That's number one. Number two, the alternatives were not great 25 or 30 years ago. Uh, photovoltaics was 100 times more expensive. No one quite knew how to do this anyway, though we could see how dangerous it was, but the technologies didn't exist. Tesla uh, wasn't even in Elon Musk's imagination, uh, much less the idea of uh, a world of electric vehicles. So the technology options uh, were, were limited. And then third is the intrinsic problem of global cooperation. So the US uh, is a deeply neurotic country and its current neurosis is China and uh, the US uh, neurosis about China has been actually in uh, play for 30 years. So the Senate has said, we're not gonna do anything in, unless China does it. Uh, and China said, hell no, uh, you're an annex one country, we're not, uh, you go first, that's what the rules say. And so we lost 20 years on that particular idiocy as well. So it's not true we've had 30 years of targets. We've had 30 years of blockage. Uh, the only real targets we've had are when they're meaningful. Okay, get to zero by 2050. Now we have clarity that we're really wrecking the world. It's really dangerous. The even getting to zero by 2050 probably is only a 50-50 chance of staying below 1.5 degrees C, maybe even less than that at this point. Uh, but it's really... Uh, uh, with the standing at the cliff. Uh, so we, we need to do this. And that's why we really have the chance to get the major economies on board. And what they are announcing now is really different from what they've announced for the last 30 years. Uh, by the way, the reason they're announcing it is that the businesses come into the Oval Office or to the leadership in these other countries say, we can do this. In fact, we want to do this. Just like DuPont once went into the White House and said, we can get out of CFCs, you should make it mandatory. So the tipping point on technology enables the tipping point on uh, policy as well, because we're basically plutocratic countries. So uh, in less powerful interests say, this is okay, we're not gonna get too far. But now powerful interests say, yeah, we can make a lot of money. Big money is going to go into renewables. Now it's okay to do. Europe's on board. Europe got on board earlier because it doesn't have much fossil fuel, so it can think more clearly about all of this without the backlash. Wherever Europe has fossil fuels, it's a mess, uh, whether it's uh, German uh, coal fields uh, or uh, uh, Asturias uh, in Spain or Poland, or then you have the same nonsense. But it, that's very small parts of Europe. So Europe got on board soon. The United States has been in a battle between our fossil fuel regions and our non-fossil fuel regions. It's called the Democrats versus Republicans or the red states versus the blue states. But now enough of the red states are investing in wind and solar that they're not really so convinced because Texas is gonna be the biggest wind and solar power in the United States. So this is also changing. The Dakotas are realizing they have so much wind power, this is incredible. Offshore wind has plummeted in price, so the US Northeast, which doesn't have fossil fuels anyway, now has a very clear option. So it's the combination of having an alternative and having clarity uh, about what needs to be done. We still have, as I said, Russia, Saudi Arabia, uh, the Gulf region. It's not simple. Uh, we're not done with this story yet, but we're really close to a tipping point right now because the pathway is clear and the, uh, the practicalities are clear. And if we don't have World War III with China, we could even cooperate with China. So it's either we're going to blow up the world or we're going to save the climate. I'm not sure which, depending on what comes out of the US government these days. But finally, let me say a word about uh, Lola's point about different countries, different timelines. There's really no reason for the world not to decarbonize by 2050. We all are gonna drive the same electric vehicles. Uh, we can all decarbonize the uh, 
decarbonize the uh, um, uh, the power grid uh, by 2050. Uh, we are all going to be flying the same airplanes because only uh, three countries make uh, long haul civil aviation airplanes. Uh, it's going to be China, uh, Airbus, and Boeing. Uh, and so it's not really so hard to do this. What is different across countries is who should pay for it. So the rich countries should be paying a lot more. That, that's where we should put the emphasis on the side payments, not on the timelines. You know, we, the timelines are not hard. It, it's really uh, who bears costs and so forth. And there the rich countries are pretty outrageous. They spent 12 years promising a hundred billion a year and they could not make it. Uh, and a hundred billion a year is nothing. The United States has spent $5 trillion over the last 13 months for COVID, but the whole rich world couldn't find a hundred billion for the, all the developing countries. It, maybe that goes to Scott's point that the world's just so surly and impossible to cooperate. So I would agree with Scott on that. It's a nasty, stupid world uh, in that way. But, but my point is from the timeline uh, point of view, it's not really differentiating by timelines. It's really differentiating by financing. Uh, and I would argue, even on the optimistic side, it's not so hard to come up with a, a hundred billion, 200 billion, 400 billion of low cost capital for this. And I'm pushing in particular a massive uh, recap of the multilateral development banks as the, the most uh, important direct way to do this. So Inter-American Development Bank, Asian Development Bank, uh, European Investment Bank, African Development Bank, Islamic Development Bank. These I think are the best tools actually for the, uh, the global financing. Uh, just to maybe one other round for some of you just want to push back on what I've heard. Uh, one is I, I get a sense that technologically it's totally feasible. Targets are important, but it's part of kind of a strategy. And you really need a few key countries in the world to step forward. Well, you, more than a few, you need to really uh, to reach a tipping point. The, you need the big ones. Yeah. So, so the, 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 the key I want to, the, the, for the panel to consider is what is it about kind of self-interest that simply doesn't get motivated when it comes to climate issues? Uh, many of you have said the vast amounts of money that was raised for COVID uh, in, in, in literally in a, in a trice. Uh, the vast amounts of money that gets deployed regularly for uh, defense and armaments. Uh, so what is it special, and I think uh, Scott said uh, the issue of kind of uh, collective self-interest as being very different from individual self-interest. So when it comes to climate, given the nasty kind of political economy issues and not just the fossil fuel, for example, also important thing is to, is to bear in mind the important principle of common but differentiated responsibility and capacities that now seem to be ignored and it's one of the enshrined principles of UNFCCC. And that simply has been kind of, in some sense, they pay lip service to it. But and as, as uh, Professor Sachs, Jeff said, look, uh, they, we couldn't raise 100 billion by 2020. And so I would ask kind of each of you just to kind of have a very brief, uh, share your thoughts on what is it about the political economy that makes it so challenging? beyond the US being a surly country or beyond the, the fossil fuel uh, kind of lobbying and so on, what is it that has prevented us uh, over the last 25 years? Well, I'm, I'm happy to start out. Um, I, I think this is the most difficult collective action problem in world history and the institutions that we have in place, which obviously are imperfect, but have served um, their purpose in, in, in other areas uh, are just simply inappropriate for this particular problem. Um, uh, 
when countries come together in Paris and they agree on a collective goal, I think they're sincere. I think they really want to meet it. I don't think that's the issue. Um, the issue is uh, that uh, you do have this problem of self-interest. I'm not any kind of advocate for self-interest. It's just, uh, it's a primary human motive. It's not the only human motive. You know, we care about many other things too. So it's not a, a, a simple, um, issue, but how else can you explain why countries meet in Paris, they agree on a collective goal, they then set their own individual pledges for meeting the goal, you add up the pledges, and they come nowhere near meeting the goal. I mean, that is the t almost, you know, it's the prediction of the collective action. Are there other explanations? Yeah, I'm sure there are. I'm not saying this is the only one, but I think to neglect this one, it, it would be a real problem. Uh, Jeff used uh, this term, a tipping point, which is an overused term, um, generally speaking. I think people misunderstand what it means. Jeff doesn't misunderstand, so uh, I don't want to be confused there. But I think what's, what happens with a tipping point, you know, it can occur in markets naturally. That example I gave of unleaded petrol and moving towards um, that as a worldwide standard, that was a market not only market, governments were also pushing, but really but the priority at the local level. But that brought about a transformation because you're talking about a system. This is how we need to look at energy. And this is how we need to look at human society. As individuals back in And um, so tipping point that caused to switch and in fact sub-Saharan Africa to go on um, and that's become a global outcome. With, with Montreal there clearly has been a tipping phenomenon. Now the question is what's driving that? I'm confident, I, I mean I'm very happy for other people to disagree and we can engage on this but I'm very confident that that Montreal protocol itself was, was critical in creating the tipping point and it really was driven through the trade side where it's because you were going to be locked out of big markets that you wanted to, um, to join in. And that also gave, in terms of the behavioral side, it gave confidence to other countries that if they did the right thing, they could rely on the others doing the right thing. And that together they can get where they want to get to. We've never had that kind of confidence in the climate system. And really all I'm pleading for is that we try to develop a system that builds that confidence. And I don't think targets on their own are sufficient. Coupled with something like this, then it's, then it's different. So I think that's, that's the, the main thing I would wanna point out. On, on the um, issues of you know, equity and so on and the financing, um, obviously issues of um, uh, uh, inequality and so on have, have been part of this from the very beginning. I would say that you know, this principle of common but differentiated responsibilities has been a problem. It's not that I don't agree with that. <laughs> it's, it's not what I'm saying. It has been a problem. Uh, because once that was agreed, then in 1995 in Berlin, countries agreed that the rich countries should act and the poor countries should not until later, and they become rich. So they have to develop like us, build a lot of coal-fired power stations, and then later on reduce them. That was simply not the right way to go. So I, I think sticking to these principles actually can be uh, counterproductive. All that $100 billion pledge, um, I, I was completely sure that it would never be met. I mean, there are so many problems with it. I don't know where to begin. I mean, no one even knows what a dollar, what it actually is. You actually measure it. There's no, there's no amount for individual countries, uh, not even as a goal. But if you look at, uh, it's not as if we can't do this. So people should not take this idea of side payments off the table. These equity issues are really important, not just in their own, but because the rest of the world, let's say the rich countries need the poorer countries to act with them. They need that and they're willing to pay for it. So that's how I think you should look at it, not as a act of generosity, but really it is an act of national self-interest. And we've done this, we do this. Um, that's how the UN operates. That's how in the Montreal Protocol is a transfer uh, arrangement. So it's really the carrot, I would call it, coupled with the stick. So if you get the system of incentives right, that behavior works. The Montreal Protocol Fund has always been fully funded. It's never been short of money. Um, but countries that are putting money into it know they're getting something back for it. And we need to set up a system for climate that works the same way. 
Okay, we just have maybe just one more before one more uh, one of the participants can come in before we hand it over to Alex to take over the Q and A from our audience. I, I wanted to say a rousing agreement with everything Scott just said. I agreed with every word of it. Uh, you know, politics are local and it, unbelievably local. So even if you're the chancellor of Germany and there's 16 Lander, if one of them uses lignite, that's local. Uh, West Virginia is a swing state for the United States. Joe Manchin, uh, our West Virginia senator, is the swing vote in the US Congress right now on countless issues, including this one. Politics are local. That's the sense in which our institutions are not geared towards global collective action. Uh, and I agree uh, wholeheartedly, targets are necessary in my view and not sufficient. Uh, so we need to add incentives around them. I like the European border adjustment uh, proposal, for example. Uh, it has scared a lot of countries around the world. Bravo. They're saying, oh, hell, uh, we need to export to Europe. Uh, and maybe this is serious. And I'm watching it close up. Ministers who don't care about this issue saying, mm, you know, my prime minister has asked me, what is this European border tax thing? How's that going to affect us? So that matters a lot. And the United States is opposed to it right now, which is, you know, uh, also because of our crazy politics, local, not because of the lack of merit of the proposal. So we need targets and we need to build around those targets enforcement mechanisms. Uh, again, I believe that quantitative regulatory enforcements plus things like the border adjustment taxes and so forth should, should both be used. It would be smart for the world somehow as a whole to say after 2035, uh, we're not, I mean, Many, many countries are now saying after 2035, we're not going to uh, allow uh, internal combustion engine new car sales. If we get that, that's almost to the tipping point also, because there's no major auto company that I know of that isn't planning a complete switch over to electric vehicles for light duty vehicles now. So we're probably already there. Trucking's a different issue. Even aviation, uh, Boeing is talking about uh, zero emission airplanes by 2030. I don't know what they mean, but they're talking about that. So there's really, we're close. We really are close. Okay, so, well, thank you very much indeed. I, I just wanted to get the audience now, and I know there's lots of um, things we could have carried on talking about. So I wanna try and bring people back in to talk about some of these issues as we go along. There's a question from uh, Aishwarya uh, around the issue of corporations. Self-interest is the driving force around the world in climate action and energy transitions. We've just been talking about self-interest. However, there is still no global sustainability standard for big corporations. How can we negotiate the same in the upcoming negotiations? Is it even on the agenda? So I don't know where to start here. I felt I should maybe start with Franny and, and, and see what her perspective is, but Feel free to dive in, all of you. Franny? Uh, yes, thanks, Alex, uh, for the question from the audience. Um, I, I would like also to pick up maybe on one point that came in the previous uh, responses by Scott and, uh, and Jeff. Uh, when you look at large corporations, uh, the, their, their incentive to transform the way they do business uh, has to be accepted by broad, a broad set of stakeholders. And that's what makes it a bit more complex, for example, than when small or medium enterprises take a decision, a business decision to transform. So the, the ability of the broader uh, stakeholders around large corporations to drive change uh, becomes significant. And I think the success we've had as a, as a world with child labor is a good example. When you look around the world today, it is very rare to find products that are now produced using child labor because there was so much effort that went, first of all, pulling on the heartstrings to show images of why it is so bad to be using child labor. And even poor countries where 
chil children needed to work to support their families had to adopt and move towards this global collective standard of no child labor in manufacturing, in mining, and in many other activities. And the large corporations sh shifted their behavior because they were policed by, this, by society. There were reports about Nike, uh, carpet manufacturers who had child labor in India with a silk uh, handmade or hand knotting. You had uh, child, child mining of diamonds and so on, which was publicly uh, uh, looked, frowned upon. And, and a lot of attention came to companies that were benefiting from that. So I think this is an example where we have to touch the heartstrings of individuals in order for them to push for large scale change. We have to have standards that can be easily enforceable to say there has not been, in this case, child labor. So we can vi visually see that. And of course, the third part then, there has to be an alternative. Uh, other means of production that allow that transformation to take place without additional additional cost, because companies would, would usually not accept if the costs become too high. And I'm seeing this now in the examples of the fossil fuel companies, where they have realized that by supporting R&D in renewable energy, by buying into companies that are producing renewable energy, by investing in the, in the green hydrogen as a future, they're preparing a future for themselves. So it is self-interest that's driving large corporate uh, uh, change, large scale corporate change. And it's driven by pressure coming from individuals within the company. If you talk to the CEO of IKEA or other companies and you ask them, why did you change? They say my own children and my own employees wanted this transformation. So it, it, this issue of self-interest driving corporate business strategy and transforming corporate behavior still remains the key issue. And therefore, how do you en get that kind of behavioral adaptation at the individual level that pushes for corporate change, I think is the key. Friday, that's great. Any other, anybody else want to quickly dive in on this before we move on to another question? Lena, you need to unmute. Yes, on, on this particular question, I think uh, the examples that were given by Franny were very good. The only thing that we need to uh, worry about is the timeline. That is, you know, wh whether you look at child labor issues, Franny, or whether you look at cigarette smoking and, and things like that, the time taken for both industry and consumers to respond is enormously long. And that's the one luxury that we do not have. So I do believe that while self-interest is key, there has to, it has to be supported and pushed by regulation, which has a very key role to play. Uh, and there are a few initiatives that are coming around in this area, but I think I uh, accept Aishwarya's point that a lot more needs to be done over here to be able to push the big corporations to move towards, uh, towards a higher degree of sustainability. I also wanted to very quickly in the context of the earlier discussion, uh, just highlight one thing that I think we are missing completely possibly in this discussion, which is the role of demand reduction, Shiv. I think uh, when we are talking about uh, you know, uh, meeting some of the climate targets, we cannot be looking at alternative ways of continuing at the same levels of consumption that we have had. And uh, looking at demand reduction very seriously is critically important and, and this needs to be done. And we haven't yet discussed, of course, the role of uh, digitization and the move to a digital economy and what that can do for demand reduction. I think we really have to look at uh, completely different ways, systemic transformations. And for that, the underlying governance systems, science systems, all of these need to be evaluated very carefully. Okay. So um, let's get to another question from Bruno. Uh, what is your assessment of what seems to be a rush for green investment, ESG, of many financial sectors um, and uh, IFIs and corporates? Um, who wants to dive into that? Um, Lola, do you want to get into that? Thanks. Um, the rush, the rush, I would say, is um, it's all relative. So there's there's a huge, you know, on, on small on small numbers, I would say that there's a, a huge increase. Um, but I think in taking a step back, I, my assessment is that we're still quite far, actually, from meeting one of the 
long-term goal of the Paris Agreement regarding finance. You know, we had one goal on mitigation, which was carbon neutrality by mid-century, one on adaptation, and one uh, about redirecting all financial flows to be consistent with the, you know, achieving the, the first two. Um, and I think, by and large, we're, we're not there because there's not enough um, also accountability of the, the many investors coalition that have sprung around. And, I, and I'm not, it's not to say that these aren't good. They're, they're really great to kind of set standards and try and generate momentum among key actors. Um, but I think all too often there's, there's a real risk of, of greenwashing and, and a lack of credible plan for transitioning um, away from fossil fuels and, and uh, away from polluting technologies uh, in many cases. And it's not because you point to the few percent of renewables in your portfolio that you're actually you know shifting uh the 98 percent yeah. um and i think that's a that's a real risk I, I think more interesting and to me the the real pioneers are, are maybe in the the multilateral development banks and the, the development finance institutions trying to support uh transitions in the the countries that they're supporting in development and cooperation um because I think there's a, a growing momentum to align to Paris Agreement goals and to support countries to define their own uh, low carbon development pathway. And uh, uh, the French government agency has started doing this and I, I know it's something of interest in many other bigger development banks. Okay, great. Um, uh, there's quite a few questions. I mean, feel free to get um, dive in. We've only got a few more minutes though, uh, but if you wanna ask more questions, I've got a couple here that have come in. Uh, one from uh, Jana uh, Sions from Sions Po. I would like to ask the panelists to elaborate on the issue of inclusive transition, what that refers to exactly and what are the ways to achieve it? We've talked about it um, a bit already in some of the discussion, Lena referred to it, of course. And I think that the, uh, you know, the, the whole way of decarbonizing, I mean, it's a bit like dealing with a pandemic. If you Look at the Ebola crisis. We rolled out vaccines and did great things in public health, but actually understanding the social anthropology of, of the communities was critical to eradicating Ebola in that first outbreak in Sierra Leone. And so understanding people is massive to this climate crisis as well, and the reaction uh, of certain communities and how we're gonna make it inclusive for them. So who wants to dive in on this? I, was, I like the verbiage that comes out of Europe on this, on, in their, in their um, New Deal, but at the same time, what do we actually do practically to to make bring people along with us? Maybe I'll say a couple of things uh, quickly about this. Uh, there are different aspects of inclusion. One is the jobs issue of uh, the jobs that will be lost in the fossil fuel related sectors and the jobs that will be gained in the uh, green sectors, almost every study that I know of shows that the job gains are uh, greater than the job losses in this transformation. So this is not a net uh, job killer, but definitely livelihoods are affected. And then one needs uh, a uh, social and political response to that. Uh, every country that has a coal sector has to deal with its coal region and with its coal workers. So Germany did that in a coal commission uh, and it stretched out the closing down of uh, lignite to 2038, but it is phasing it out. Spain had a similar action. The United States is grappling with this right now. Uh, I'm sure that uh, Senator Manchin of West Virginia is going to ask what's in it for me and for my state in all of this. So jobs is one, one issue uh, that, that uh, plays a, a significant role. Uh, I would add to this climate damages as a, a vast, definitely undertapped and underrepresented area all over the world. Uh, people are suffering massively from uh, anthropogenically induced disasters. Generally, uh, in poor countries, uh, these countries are left to their own devices when 
a Category 5 hurricane hits or when rising sea levels uh, destroys a Delta region. And this is completely unjust because the responsibilities uh, are not borne by those who cause them. The United States is responsible for 25% of the historic emissions of CO2, for example. So I think justice also requires addressing the climate disasters in a way that reflects historic responsibility, which the rich countries and especially the United States have completely sloughed off to this point, but needs to be on the table. Yeah. I think it's also right to say, just uh, even uh, obvious but important to say, climate is not the sole venue in which injustices need to be addressed. So we can't also expect the climate regime, policy regime to address all injustices, but we sh certainly should have shared responsibility when it comes to the climate related facts of uh, injustice. I guess the danger, of course, if we don't address this, is that there'll be a different government that comes in, a populist government that takes advantage of, of people's... Uh, hard to imagine, isn't it? Anyway, so... Uh, but there are... if, if I'm, uh, just a, what, like, I know so the other risk is we're also asking for radical transformations of the way we produce, we consume things. And so if we want to be serious about doing all this that's going to impact massively people in their daily life, we might as well try and sell it with uh, making life better at the same time because otherwise why would they jump in can i just also add uh one frozen, Scott. sorry <laughs> oh my apologies you're freezing can you hear me i can uh, yeah, now I we can. hear you yeah oh, okay i'm sorry <laughs> gosh uh, I don't know about the rest of you, but I've had enough Zoom <laughs> in my life. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say that um, I think it's, an, you know, Jeff has put his finger on the pulse of politics. It's really critical. And I think the social sciences haven't done enough to, to answer fundamental questions. Um, how can you devise, let's say, a domestic bill that has a, to address a problem like climate, even if only a piece of it, that has a chance of being uh, uh, adopted, number one, implemented, number two, and number three, um, successful in actually achieving its goal. I think we, we, we fall short of that. Um, I'll give you just a, a, a quick example because I think it's um, illustrative of, of the general problem. The province of British Columbia adopted a carbon tax many, many years ago. Uh, and despite uh, changes in government, left to right, back and forth, uh, that policy has endured and it's been increased over time. Right next door, the state of Washington, which if, if, you, weren't, <laughs> if you weren't paying attention to humans, looks a lot like British Columbia. So it's like very similar. Um, they have vote, they voted for a carbon tax because they watched what their neighbor was doing and uh, they lost. This is in a referendum, which by the way, this is one of the key issues about our institutions. I mean, look at the, uh, uh, I don't need to tell Alex about referenda. So um, they, they voted it down. Actually environmental groups were opposed to that carbon tax because the revenue was gonna be returned to citizens, which is how the British Columbia tax works. Uh, in a progressive way, which is, um, I find a bit ironic. But anyway, they regrouped, tried again uh, with another referendum. And this time they were doing what the environmental groups wanted was to take the resources, the, the money from the tax and use it towards renewable energy investments and things like that. That one also failed. Now we have to have an answer to the question about why those approaches failed why British Columbia succeeded and so on. And I feel like that is a missing piece in how the social sciences, I, I think particularly political science, but generally speaking, the social sciences can actually address this question at the, at the local level that Jeff mentioned about, you know, how do you actually bring about policies that will really change things? Okay, so we're gonna have to finish in a second. I just wanna fire a couple of quick questions to a couple of people. Um, Franny, this one's for you. Um, and a quick answer. 
Um, how can we arrange developed and technologically advanced economies to voluntarily direct green investments and funds to less developed parts of the world? Should we leave this responsibility to be driven by self-interest or should we build a mechanism at global level? <laughs> You've got to answer in two minutes, one minute. Uh, two quick answers. Uh, if we are going to use the self-interest that drives corporate activity, then uh, R&D in uh, greenfield is a good incentive for those companies. And you see it with renewable energy where you can develop solutions in Africa because there are no legacy systems and those innovations can then be transported back to advanced uh, economies. Uh, second is by uh, trade. And I think uh, Scott mentioned that developing products in regions where they allow you to trade and you benefit from that. Textile industry is a good example. If you have renewable energy and non-pollution in making organic textiles, the only place you can do that is in countries that are growing organic cotton and other fibers and don't have a polluting energy system. So you can actually develop such textiles and export them to the world. So trade could be another incentive. Okay, that's great. And now a quick question for Lola. Um, this one's from someone called Sophia. Um, you mentioned offsetting. Do you think that offsetting has a bright future in the private sector? Could it really be an option for financing sustainable development somehow? Or do you not think so? Quick um, I think offsetting is, is a limited solution because ultimately we need to get to net zero by 2050 and negative emissions thereafter. Um, so let's not forget what comes afterwards. So we need to just reduce emissions. So offsetting can work in the very short term and it can be a way to mobilize finance to invest in the technologies which are still uh, evading us, but it can only be transitory. So it's very dangerous if companies say that they're neutral now when they're actually massively buying carbon credits. And I'm not you know, calling them out. I think it's a good concept and it's good that they're trying to do something. But we have to be clear about what it means for companies and also what it means for countries in the context of the international carbon market discussions under the NFCCC. Okay. Well, thank you. I'm afraid we've run out of time. Uh, we've got more questions we could have answered. But um, Sheaf, back to you. Uh, okay. So I'm not trying to wrap up this uh, impossible to wrap up discussion. It's been kind of lively, engaging. Uh, but I was hoping for a little bit more of the bouts. Uh, there were a little bit of um, kind of nice jabs here and there, but then there was just kind of, you guys started agreeing with, with, with everyone else, which was a little bit like, mm, this is not the way it's supposed to happen. You're supposed to keep the audience engaged. So uh, uh, my kind of takeaway seems to be that, yeah, and it's a very broad takeaway. Yeah, behavior change is critical for kind of climate change. And here we are talking of kind of both at an individual level and collective level. But the problem is we don't have institutions and the politics are not structured to kind of make this happen. And that's, it. that's part of the missing, uh, uh, a, a critical component. The second is kind of the role of uh, uh, developed economies and their kind of responsibilities for kind of rest of the world, even in an extended way of kind of looking at self-interest. Kind of, so how do we kind of mobilize, mobilize that and getting over the kind of the political economy hump, if not uh, kind of the, the, the wall of uh, that it now kind of uh, stares at us. So we're going to be watching with great interest what's going to happen uh, in a week's time. And uh, with the 40 leaders or their high level representatives in Washington, D.C. And since we have uh, four minutes, I'd like just like a round from a panelist here just very brief, and then finally kind of wrap up by Alex. What is it that you think would happen in Washington, DC? Jeff, over to you. Since all politics is local, let's begin with you. I, I think we're gonna have a pretty good meeting. Uh, and I think that uh, governments are going to say we need to get to net zero by 2050 and we should work on it. Uh, I don't think it'll be uh, too much beyond that, but that won't be bad. Okay. It's not polite to accept the invitation and then wreck the meeting. So I think people will be polite. That's uh, uh, not exactly a resounding. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I, well, you know, these, you don't solve the world uh, at these meetings, uh, 
but they're not bad to have. But you don't. What, what's happening, by the way, is countries that weren't invited are saying, what's wrong with our policy? So it, it already has spinoffs uh, in places uh, that you wouldn't expect. I know it. I'm, uh, I'm seeing some of those governments uh, saying, you know, we want to raise our hand and show that we're doing something. What should we do? Okay. If I could just maybe add briefly, Shiv. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know what they're going to do, but I, I know what they need to do. Um, there, there really needs to be, um, and I think this is why Biden convened the meeting. I mean, he believes in multilateralism, but, you know, come on, we need to show that multilateralism will actually work. You can't just want it <laughs> for its own sake. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I think that's what, that's what we really need. For the United States to move forward, uh, which it can in a number of ways domestically, particularly as it focuses on other uh, goals in addition to climate change. Uh, but it really does need this assurance that other countries are going to move in lockstep and that together it's going to make a big difference. And I, what I really hope is that they don't just say this, but they actually start to think about how to, to create the strategic uh, perspective on the need to shift uh, globally and going to this kind of tipping phenomenon that Jeff mentioned before. That's the thing that's critical. And I hope that John Kerry especially has learned the lessons uh, from the past that approaching this problem directly is simply not effective. It's not that people aren't in, you know, are, are insincere. They're not, I think they're sincere, but that's not enough to get you what you need. So that's the bit that I, I really hope they introduce. And it's a process, it won't be done instantly. But that's the bit that I think that they really need to introduce that would be novel and potentially a game. Okay, uh, Lena? Yeah, I, I think there will be a lot of uh, excitement uh, uh, because of the US coming back in and therefore uh, a drive for other countries also to step up and try and make some commitments. But I also think that there will be a reiteration of the need for uh, for some of these uh, support mechanisms that we have been talking about. Okay, uh, Alex, I know wants to come in, but quickly, Franny and Lola, 20 seconds each. Um, I think there'll be big news in local papers about what their governments are doing. Uh, they will be a subgroup of governments that would announce big initiatives that they'll do together. And I think there may be one or two big announcements by the US that could be implemented through executive order. That's my prediction. Okay, very fair. Um, and I hope uh, a, new, a new momentum uh, for the, the global climate action. That's probably the US not only doing things at home, but also saying that it can be a, become again, a credible leader and organizer of international action. Um, let's see how this goes. Thank you. Over to you, Alex. For the final well, um, I just wanted to say thank you, everybody. It's been fantastic. This has been a great discussion. Wonderful to have such um, brilliant people to engage with. And of course, that's part of what we can do in this world where we no longer have to fly into New York or Paris or whatever. We can actually connect in this way. So <clears throat> notwithstanding that Scott's Wi-Fi is a little bit won wonky, it's been great and uh, uh, really, really good. So I think the, the takeaways, I think, from all of this are that we've had a, um, uh, what we've got to do is really hard in some respects, um, because the, the, the scale of what we've been talking about for many years um, hasn't really had the kind of impact that we hoped it would have. And so I was quite, um, I was struck by what Scott and Jeff and other people said about, you know, no, you know, how is this really going to work given the way we've actually been setting up things in terms of targets and goals. Um, and sure enough, you know, we actually have increasing carbon dioxide emissions, increasing use of coal contributing to those at the same time as the overall um, share of the energy sector is, um, you know, increasing in terms of renewables, the total consumption is such. And, you know, a carbon dioxide atom, atom in the uh, molecule in the atmosphere doesn't care where it came from. It doesn't care which country or which, which coal stack it came out of. And so this has got to be a global action uh, that we have to deal with. There's a number of things we didn't talk about much, in particular negative emissions, I think, and how that might play a role uh, and to what extent we can slow this down and how we do that in terms of um, 
you know, organizing this globally. Um, I think there are a number of issues around that, the pathways that we have to decarbonization that we could also get into. But I was struck by, uh, at the end of the day, despite the, um, uh, how serious this is and, and the fact that we're driving the climate in a very dangerous way at the moment, uh, that in the long time, over hundreds and hundreds of years, we're going to see um, things getting worse and worse. Despite that, you know, there's a great sense of optimism around this group of people. Uh, and I think part of that is because we are in a situation where there are solutions and we can see solutions and people are seeing opportunities, not just in terms of uh, technology, but also investment and also the way that um, there are drivers from investors. I was particularly struck by the comment about um, the fact that stakeholders, employees um, of co corporations can actually, and, and investors can actually make a, have a major impact. And of course, banks can have a major impact on companies uh, in terms of seeing how they change their practices towards um, more responsible ways of behaving in terms of carbon neutrality. So um, I share a certain sense of optimism, I think, and I agree. It'd be interesting to see how Boeing is going to do it. But at the same time, there is a, it's great that there's a sense of, yes, this is exciting. It's something we want to be involved in uh, going forward. I think one of the things that struck me most um, is this issue about how do we avoid um, going backwards again as a result of um, disenfranchising communities, not carrying them with us, in this. That is a massive threat to what we're trying to do. And I think it's not just an American issue, it's a sort of global issue. How do you carry communities along with, the, with you? So I do think there's a ton of work to be done on that. And I think Scott's illustration of British Columbia and Washington State was a classic um, illustration of the, the problem we face. But it's, it's going to be on steroids as we start to decarbonize the coal industry and, and the oil and gas industry going forward. Um, and at the same time, we've got every reason to be optimis optimistic because there are, like Jeff said, many more jobs going to be available uh, down the road. The other thing I think that was really, which we didn't talk about quite as much as I think we might have done, but uh, which it relates, of course, to jobs, and we focused on jobs, is are the other aspects of social justice. And I think actually the fact that certain countries are going to be not just going to be left behind in terms of the impacts on their economies, they're going to be decimated by climate change. And so what are we going to do about uh, working to help those countries and actually help them adapt and provide them with the money they need to rebuild in the, you know, as, they, as, the, as climate change gets worse? What are going to be the issues of governance that we need to think about? We have right now, we have, uh, you know, a recognition that you can have refugees who have a certain status because they're fleeing from war. But what about um, people who are fleeing from climate and actually having to move and migrate uh, to different uh, parts of the world from Africa to Europe or whatever as a result of that? And then the other thing we didn't really talk about much, uh, and because it's not really this part of the discussion, but I think it's important, is that there are going to be big health impacts uh, that people are going to find certain parts of the world really hard to live in, not just because of decimation from uh, hurricanes or whatever, but actually because of the heat stress, because we actually haven't really put humans through this kind of a climate before. And so we've got to get our head around how we're going to deal with that. How are people going to be living in different parts of the world? The food security issues as we see the bread parts, bread baskets of the world decimated. So there's a lot to think about that actually relates to justice and how do we think globally about this problem um, beyond just thinking about um, some of the political economic drivers that we might make to decarbonize going forward. So I think those are the main things that I wanted to say, but I, I just wanted to quickly summarize, uh, say two quick things that, that I brought out. One was this idea of that people raised of tipping points, which of course we've been talking about in the science literature for a long time in terms of tipping points towards things getting really bad with the climate system. Um, but people are talking about a tipping point in terms of people's, the way people are thinking and the way that people are feeling and the way people are governing uh, on this issue. And I think that is really, really important. And this is a critical year for actually pushing forward on that agenda. Um, and then the last thing that I thought was massively important was what Lola said. She used this term, well-targeted innovation. And of course, when we think about a university like Columbia or Sciences Po, we actually don't tell people what to do. We say, just go off and be innovative. And that's what your job is to do. And we hire the brightest and best to be innovative. 
But actually, at some level, we've got to think maybe differently, particularly in universities, about this crisis that actually we have to act on quite quickly going forward, very quickly, uh, where we actually need to target our resources on this problem and actually think about how do we get academics and everybody to be innovative about this particular problem going forward. So, of course, well-targeted innovation isn't just about academics, it's also about businesses and opportunities being created in the economy. But I do think that well-targeted innovation is going to be massively important to get us out of this climate crisis going forward. And I think that's all I have to say. I thought it was brilliant. Thank you very much indeed, Chief, for um, suggesting this in the first place. But I'd like to thank everybody else as well for um, participating. It's been great to be part of this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex, and uh, all of you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.